Hi, my name is Rahasia, and I'm from Lotus Guide. And today we're going to be interviewing Harvey Bigelson. He wrote a book called Holographic Blood. Now, the first couple times I heard this guy talk, it was really difficult to wrap my head around this. But if you're familiar with Dr. Emoto's work and some of Bruce Lipton's work and physicists at large, you will know that the universe, the best possible explanation on what all of this is, this reality, you, me, everybody, everything, is that it's a holographic projection. Now, it only stands to reason if this is true, and some of the smartest people on the planet say that this really looks like it's the case, then we need to pay attention to new theories and new ideas and new therapies. And Harvey's information is really curious because it is totally pointed us towards a holographic projection in our blood to see what's wrong with us. So let's uh, listen to see what Harvey has to say. And thanks for tuning in. So Harvey, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, and first of all, let me tell you something. I first became familiar with you uh, from Bruce Lipton. Him and I were talking one time and he told me all about you. And I've caught a couple of your lectures. So it's, uh, I'm a little bit familiar with your work, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your history, and eventually I would like to sort of open this up to the holographic universe theory in general. Okay. Okay? So okay. tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I am an MD. Uh, I was a trauma surgeon in Vietnam. Uh, I gave up traditional medicine, oh, in the mid 70s because I got really frustrated uh, that only using pharmaceuticals and surgery and I started to look for other answers. I started to look for natural medicine and how to really help and improve the body. And that's been my work for a number of years now, how to regenerate the body. Uh, I started, I was sponsored by a private foundation about 30 years ago to go to Europe to see what they're doing and we ended up in outside of Quebec at a French-Canadian physicist uh, office, Gaston Naissons, who had a microscope that he looked at the live blood. And I've never seen the live blood. I'm only the third American in US history that's actually looked at a drop of blood under a microscope without staining it that was living. And there were things that were moving in the blood that just blew me away. There was no name for American literature, lots of activity in the blood. And I knew it had to be important, okay? Because uh, you know, this is the blood, this is the life of the body. So I got myself a microscope and I started to look at it and study it and I found a German physician that worked on an Indian reservation that was doing this type of work. And my son had acute mononucleosis at the time. He was going to go off to school on Saturday. On Monday, he had a 104 temperature, his tonsils were green, swollen, shot pus, his liver enzymes were abnormal, and he had positive mono test. Well, mono is a six month disease. We figured he couldn't go to school, but we called this German doctor down and he had a microscope and he studied the blood and then he took out his magic penicillin, injected my son into his tonsils and told, and then he took some blood out, mixed it with a remedy and injected it back into his butt. And he said, okay, now he can go to school. Well, we were stunned at what he was talking about. And the next day, though, however, my son woke up. He sweated up all night long. Next day, he had no temperature. His tonsils were 70% pink. Day after that, they were 100% pink. On Friday, his white blood count was 6,300. His mono test was negative. His liver enzymes were normal. He off to school. He went on Saturday, and I called that German physician out and said, okay, you've got to teach me what you know how to do. Right. And that started my journey of looking at the live blood and understanding what that's about. You know, and that's usually what it takes. It, it, it takes some personal passion to go off in a direction like you've gone off in, because I would imagine that this hasn't been easy because you don't look like the kind of a person that could be put in a box. And no. when, you're, when you're dealing with the medical association and the government agencies, it, it has to be a, a lot of resistance to what you've done. Oh, I've, I've met tremendous resistance from the system. In fact, uh, I, I wrote the Arizona Homeopathic Medical Practice Act, allowing MDs that were being persecuted for alternative medicine to go under their own licensing agency. And I was on TV and I was in the news and, well, 
the state we controlled, but the feds then came after me. In fact, I had, I got it one day, I was solicited by Medicare. They came into my office to sign me up. They never, ever do that. I was naive at the time. Well, since I was doing so well in practice, I signed up to Medicare. Within a month, I got my first check for Medicare, and all of a sudden, I got a random Medicare audit. They, I was one of three presenter physicians picked up a random audit. They randomly picked out 28 cases out of my several thousand files. Those 28 cases all involved something called chelation therapy, something I never did in my entire career, but I had a guy that worked with me for three months. Those were his 28 cases. This was their random pick. At the end of three months of an audit, they said, you know, your procedures don't fit out codes. Why don't you code it this way? And they told me exactly how to code it. Three years later, they had grand jury hearings on fraudulent coding. After three years of grand juries, they indicted me on 117 counts of Medicare fraud, totally $3,500. Total, the lowest indictment in U.S. history. At the same time, Senator Bill Frist opened up a series of HMOs, and he got a Medicare fraud misdemeanor for $1.7 billion, which he paid off in two checks. I got an indictment for $3,500. It would have cost me up to a million dollars just to defend myself, so we plea bargained to $145, and I had to give up my licenses and get out of the country. So that's a lot of my history with the U.S. Well, it's been a gift to the rest of us because it's taken you down a path of discovery. Yes. You know, and don't even get me started with the government and the Rockefellers, how he buried homeopathy. And I mean, oh, totally. it, it, this has a long story of government and certain people intervening to direct us into allopathy, and it's been a dangerous road. I mean, as a surgeon, you must know this. It's very scary. Rockefeller started off in 1910 by sponsoring the AMA. At that time, there were five different types of schools that were uh, healthcare schools. They all lost their charter by 1947. Flower Fifth Avenue and Hahnemann Medical College became allopathic schools. They lost their homeopathic charter. And Rockefeller himself died at the age of 97, a vegetarian all his life, a homeopathic physician in attendance, and never taken a drug into his mouth. So that tells you a lot about the story of what, what right. that is. And the persecutions that have gone on have been absolutely incredible. If they can pick out 28 cases out of my 5,000 files, I mean, they're spying on us. That's yeah. very, very frightening. Yeah, okay. and, and it's getting progressively worse. You know, yes. and, and this is why, you know, while we still have some freedom, this is the importance of things like this, putting things like this on the Internet. We still have a few avenues of free speech, and this is one of them. So tell me, what, what is the difference between traditionally looking at a drop of blood and do you do, what is it, dark field I do dark field analysis. Right, right. But some people do something called live cell analysis, which is a lot of baloney out there you can learn on a weekend. It took me several years with two different German practitioners as an apprentice to them. I can take a drop of your blood, and I look at it in the dark field microscope. And when I look at it, there's a lot of things that are moving around, a lot of activity that there's no name for in American literature. There are little things that move around, and you can see some of my videos on, on the internet. There's little things moving around. The Germans call sympatites or symbionts. The French call somatids, and the Americans have no name for them. And those little things, they carry the chi, the ki, the prana. They actually carry the life force of the body. They're pieces of protein that can develop into bacteria, into fungus, depending on the pHs and the media and, how, and the cultures are. There is a French-Canadian physicist that I first saw with Gaston Nassans. He actually isolated these little guys, grew them in a jar, and he took a dead rat muscle and he injected it to the dead rat muscle. And 30 years later, that rat muscle is still beating in a jar. Okay. Yeah. And there's no concept in American stuff. Americans, they remind me of the moron that lost a quarter on the dog. <laughs> I looked two blocks down the street because that's where the street lamp was. You know, I once had the chief of hematology from Tufts New England Medical Center in my clinic, and he refused to look at the blood. He said, why would anyone look at the live blood? It's the chief of hematology of a Boston medical school. Refused to look at the blood. His curiosity was astounding. Yeah, this sounds like it would be a good base of understanding 
for looking into why people are even sick because I remember Bruce Lipton telling me, he says, one of the things wrong with medicine today is it's so highly specialized and complex and compartmentalized that nobody's connecting and everybody can connect with blood. The name of the game is a name today in medicine. You got to put a name on it, right. put it in a box, and then you open up the box and it tells you what to do. American medicine hasn't found the cause or the cure of one chronic disease in 100 years. Well, what makes these experts on TV? How can you be an expert if you're a 100 year failure? Do you know how low we rank in the World Health Organization? We're number 37 in the World Health Organization. French are number one. Okay. What makes us so good? There are countries ahead of us, if you look, at, look up the World Health Organization, that you've never heard of, and they're ahead of us in healthcare. I, it's I, amazing. It's brainwashing. Yeah, we, we have a lot of friends. My wife is from Brazil, and we have a lot of friends in South America and Europe, and it's amazing when you get out and travel to see a few things. One is how our news, our media news, our corporate news is so filtered down Yes. But our public services, e even public transportation, is so poor compared to some countries that it's incredible. We had some friends come back from Holland last week. They went to the Alternative Energy Conference. Uh -huh. And they came, they came back and they said, my God, how th these people are so healthy. I, I said, well, yeah, they're, they're probably just not obese. He, s he said, yeah, they all ride bicycles and you see them riding a bicycle with their briefcase and their uniforms on. They're into it, you know. Oh, let me just look at the French. The French eat like crazy, drink like crazy, smoke like crazy. They're thin as rails, and they live five to eight years longer than us. Yeah. Hey, look at us. We're so obese; it's absolutely unbelievable. We eat meals in ten minutes while watching TV. All this garbage with labels on it. The French eat fresh foods. They eat it over two to three hours. The day is over. They relax back. And, you know, I eat like crazy. And I'm, I'm really thin because I eat over an hour and a half to two hours. I take my time. I chew my food. I don't eat American style. And that, I don't think, is one of the big problems with us. Yeah, we, the first few times we went to a restaurant up here, we were sitting with my wife. And the, the waitress keeps coming up and say, are you still working on that? And it just affected her like, what do they mean? It, eating isn't working. And why yeah. are they pushing us to eat this and get out, you know? Yeah, and, you know, it's like the French chew the food. I tell the people, chew your food at least 40 times. If someone does it 20, great. Okay. We should mulch up our food in our mouth. Okay. And then let the enzyme break it down. Not us Americans. We take two bites, swallow the food, we're into the next bite already. Over there. And, and that's because there's enzymes in our saliva that aren't in the rest of our body, totally. right? The saliva, the saliva enzymes are around, uh, the pH is around 6.4. The pH of the stomach is 1. So you've got to mulch it up in the mouth first before it goes down to the heavy acid and break it down to all this stuff. The stomach doesn't have teeth in it to break down your food. Right. Okay. We have our teeth for a specific reason. So, Harvey, let, let's get into this, the holographic universe thing for a moment because right. I, I see you as a pioneer. You know, there, there are people that, for, for whatever reason, they're standing on a higher place and can look a little further over the horizon. And early in this century, people like Bohm and later on Michael Talbert wrote the uh, Holographic Universe. And yes. now, now they've been coming up with uh, experiments like the, the GEO 600 experiment. They were actually looking for gravity waves, but... More and more evidence is supporting the fact that there is no out there out there. And it seems to be a, an interference pattern if you could see it without seeing it because it's the act of observation that changes a wave into a particle. It, it's, you know, as confirmed by the double slit experiment. All of these things are adding up to the fact that it seems like within each little tiny fragment of our universe might be locked in all the information for everything in the same way as a hologram. And I think this is what you're saying about blood is when you look at one blood cell, within that blood cell, you, you can see the entire body 
and what's wrong with it, right? You see, it's not looking at the blood cell, it's looking at a drop of blood. Okay. The cells in the blood, the red cells, there's white cells and things and platelets in the blood, but also there are a lot of things that are moving in the blood. There's a lot of life going on in the blood. It's so busy, it's incredible. I've been looking at the live blood now for at least 30 years. And if a woman is pregnant, you will actually see pictures of the baby in the blood. I have pictures in my book, The Holographic Blood. Yeah, it's, I was seeing some of the, here. You know, I was seeing some of these pictures in here, and that's what I was going to ask you. It, it doesn't look like it's actually in the blood cell. You're, you're looking in the in and around the blood cells, right? Right. The, these are, these images are called simplast by the Germans. The Germans just count them. I had one German practitioner though showed me. Wait a second. Look at the shape and look exactly what that means. And you see in that book, you see the the ones, the pictures I love in that book are the pregnant woman. And you can yeah. see, the, see the fetus in the blood matching it to the sonogram, which is absolutely incredible. And every drop of blood, if you're angry, it's in every drop of blood. If you're crying, it's in every drop of blood. In acupuncture philosophy, every organ's got an emotion. The lungs are sadness, the kidneys are fear, the liver is anger. So if you keep an anger in, you'll actually see pictures of the liver in the blood. And if you've been keeping the anger in now for 20, 30 years, you can actually see the difference between you just got angry just today. There's very differences. And, and I've been studying that for years and the accuracy of it, I can tell from a drop of blood probably more about your life than you would honestly believe. If you something happened to you at the age of five and you never got over it, it's in your blood still which is absolutely amazing. Everything is there. Well, we're going to have to do this someday. We come to Grass Valley in Nevada City once every three months at least to help uh, distribution of our magazine. So maybe we can get together because there, there's something I want to talk to you about someday, but I can't even mention the guy's name in public. But he's a researcher that has to do with blood and cellular development. Well, you know, if you start to talk out of the box, um, you, they really come after you. I once had charges brought against me in Arizona that I cured a person with an illegal means. I yep. mean, the head well, of the said, we don't care if your patients are getting better or worse. We only care if you're doing the work in our way scientifically. Well, th this guy was threatened with 40 years imprisonment, and yes. they, they completely devoured his uh, finances a couple of times in his life. He ended up moving to Mexico and, you know, building his fortune back because he's a really smart guy. But what he's doing is um, uh, they're afraid of it. They're afraid of anything that would would cure people or make them healthy. You know, I, I remember talking to an old doctor about, oh, it's been about 20 years ago, and he was about 80 years old. And he was telling me, he said, when I first started in the medical profession, whenever somebody would come in the hospital, it was almost a given that they would get a colonic. But the American Medical Association found out that people were getting healthy too quick from just, just having a colonic. So they stopped doing that. Not uncommon. You know, I, I love China, best of all. You know, China, the physician is paid to keep you healthy. Right. And if you get ill, the doctor must make house calls, daily house calls, until he gets you back into the workforce. Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's yeah. We have a total different system. You, everyone makes money on disease. So the sicker you are, the more money everyone makes. That's the name of the game. And again, I'll curate the zero. Zero. Yeah. I've held that challenge out now for at least 20 years. Can anyone name one chronic disease that American medicine has found a cure for? And the answer is zero. So what makes you an expert if you have that 100-year failure? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. We have a friend that's getting ready to do chemotherapy. And, you know, I, I can't really make a decision like that for them. But just the fact that chemotherapy, I, I'm not sure if it's ever cured anybody. Well, you know, I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I can use chemo in certain ways. But cancer's a mold. They think it's cancer's one cell that goes wild, grows into a tumor, and then breaks off and gets through the blood vessels and goes different places. Well, breast cancer only goes to the bones because it's a mold that feeds on calcium. When they gave women all this hormonal therapy for menopause, and then they gave them calcium for osteoporosis, they skyrocketed breast cancer. 
You can actually measure cancer by the pH of the body, the, the, the cells are too acid, the blood is too alkaline because it's dumping alkaline wastes, and there's poor oxygen. And when you have a setup like that, cancer will develop. Doesn't it seem to have a lot to do with inflammation too? Inflammation is, a, inflammation is the key to chronic disease. If I cut you, the body will heal, will heal itself by creating inflammation to heal it. Okay, you injure yourself, the body creates the inflammation to heal it. However, the biggest problem is what I call trapped inflammation. If I do surgery on you, the body's now going to try to heal it, but now there's a scar in the way, there's adhesions in the way, and the body can't get at it. So the body's like a wind-up toy that keeps on bumping against the wall and slowly burns itself out. Trapped inflammation is the biggest cause of chronic disease. Lyme disease today, it's rampant. They, they, it's epidemic. They blame it on a germ. It has nothing to do with a germ. 80% of my patients with Lyme disease have had some type of surgery in the year before. And surgery is, I, I look at the body like an eight-cylinder car built by God. Well, they took two or three cylinders and threw it away. So now you've got chronic fatigue. You're getting 10 miles to the gallon instead of 20 miles to the gallon. The moment I treat the surgical area, all of a sudden, they're getting several miles to the gallon more, and I, that's the way I'm fixing Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is, like I said, it's rampant because we have not an epidemic of ticks, but an epidemic of surgeons. So, so how do you fix Lyme disease? What do you do? Actually, do we do we do what's called neural therapy, which which is we go after the nerve areas, and I go after what's called the obstructive areas, the interference fields. The human body has five diaphragms. We have a diaphragm in the pelvis. We have the diaphragm that you normally know. We have a diaphragm in our throat. We have two in the brain. That The whole body is constantly pumping and expanding. If you cut it and you have scars, that's adhesions and stops those pumping. The first thing I do is get that body pumping again. I treat the scars. I treat the nerve roots called neurotherapy. We actually go in and treat the nerves that are feeding the tissue to try to liven them up. And then we do osteopathic manipulation. We start to get the body opened up and pumping again. And as soon as we treat the scars and get it pumping again, lo and behold, the patient's working on now more cylinders, and they, they feel better almost instantaneously. The blood, I take a drop of blood beforehand. I take a drop of blood afterwards. You can see a change. And the patients are sitting there in the office next to me saying, am I really feeling that much better, doctor? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And it's, you know, if you think about what's the biggest injury you can have, someone putting a knife into you. Yeah. Just because it's done under anesthesia, you know, if I cut your gallbladder out behind 7-Eleven, you knew how you had a problem. But doing it in the OR, you think, oh, no big deal. Yeah. It's a big deal. The body doesn't recognize whether it's behind 7-Eleven or it's in the OR. It knows it was stabbed and cut. Yeah, I, I've been pretty lucky myself. I, I was in a fire once, which was the only time I was in a hospital which was one of the good times because they did skin grafts and all that. But it took me the good. Yeah, it took me a while to get over that. And, and it made me realize that, that there is an important balance. That's there, I guess that's why we should call it complementary medicine to be a little more palatable to the allopathic people. But there's a time and a place if you break a leg or something, you know, there's a time and a place for that. Yeah, that's that's what I call crisis medicine. And I don't throw, like I said, I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, and integrative medicine, I can integrate them, but they can't integrate me. Okay, they look at me as an outcast and anything I'm talking about, why would anyone do that? But I understand their medicine. I understand acupuncture philosophy. I understand osteopathy. I understand a lot of different things. Traditional medicine only understands pharmaceutical treatments and surgical treatments. That's all they're taught. So, it, look, you know, when I look at what you've done almost by yourself, you know, what do you think is the future of this if it would actually open up and we'd get funding and where they would give grants to young medical students to look into what you're talking about? Where, where do you think the ultimate place is that this is headed towards? Well, I think the future is, is going to happen very soon. I'm really, I'm setting up a program that if you had a microscope, I'll be able to view you. You'd be able to go into the database that if you had a hepatitis C case, you can be able to look at who else is doing what with hepatitis C. I want to set up an international, I call an international educational and research foundation without walls. I think looking at the inner life 
is going to be the future. N.K. Casey, America's most prolific psychic, said, the physician of the future with one drop of blood will diagnose the condition of the entire physical body. He said that in the 1930s. Yeah. Okay. And I think we're really heading into that now. More people are looking at it. They don't understand it enough yet, okay, because there's not enough teachers out there. My teachers have passed away, and it's a real problem that I have. But I really want to set up that so if you, someone's got a microscope in Georgia, we can communicate. Are you taking anybody under your wing and being the protege? Well, we're starting that now. Again, this is my program this year. We're setting up that program up. I now have a couple people that are interested with microscopes to tie into that. I will be teaching a class at this biomedics, uh, B-I-O-M-E-D-X. They sell, they sell the best microscope in the country. In March, I will be teaching a class of people how to look at the look at the microscope and understand the holographic nature of the being. And then, most importantly, how to look at the blood and how to manipulate the blood. And my teacher said, always remember, if I can manipulate the blood, I can manipulate you. Right. And with my remedies, I use a lot of live germs for remedies called isopathic remedies. I have a live form of penicillin that if you had pneumonia, we'd knock it out of you within, a, within a 24 hours on you. I have remedies that if you had a heart attack, we can open up open up the circulation, make a red cell so elastic and so smooth it'll squeeze through the tiniest capillary and open up the circulation. I've broken heart attacks right on the spot, and I've had cardiograms to prove that too. Yeah, this is pretty amazing, Harvey. So, you know, when, when I look at things like the universe, for, for me, it appears like we live in a conscious universe d down to the to the sub level of even even below matter into the field, the quantum field, Planck's field, uh, super strain field, whatever you want to call it. There seems to be a consciousness there that is consistently and constantly trying to communicate with us. Do you, do you think this is one of those forms where not only our bodies, but down on the cellular blood level where the universe is trying to communicate with us? Oh, without question. Without question, it's all tied up in there. Uh, we're affected. The change in the weather will affect us. The universe is affecting us. You know, your emotions will affect us. All of this. And the blood will change instantaneously. If I came in and told you, uh-oh, I found something really a problem, your blood would change. You'd get frightened right away. Your blood would change instantaneously on the spot. And we've even tested it, that we take a drop of your blood, put on a microscope, take you in another room, treat you, and your blood on the slide changes. So, so how, how much of what you do, Harvey, is intuition, and how much of what you do is a, an actually validated, teachable subject? First of all, none of it's intuition. I, I ruled out intuition. I didn't trust myself. I was doing the blood stuff, and I was doing this muscle testing called kinesiology. And after about a year... I found no no patients with cancer because I didn't want to see cancer, so I couldn't find it. Okay, <laughs> I was involved in the picture. Right. So I stopped using my intuition. And I'm completely objective. I do testing using a third party that's very objective in the way I do the testing, and I, I I rule out my intuition. I do everything by fact. I look at the blood and try to match the blood to the patient and tell me what's going on, and that doesn't intuition. Intuition's false, it, it, and because because you can be you know you don't want to tell a patient they have cancer, right? Yeah, you know, that's that, that's simple. Okay, so I do not use intuition. I use pure fact. If I can't figure out something, you'll hear me mumble under my breath. Right. Okay, what's going on? What's going on? And I'll get frustrated until I figure it out. Well, that's good. That because that makes it a teachable subject. Yes, it is. It's very teachable. It's very teachable, and my goal over the next two years is, you know, I wrote the book on it, but now my goal is now to teach people over the next two years and link us up to have that international network without walls that we can all link up our microscopes into the same databases so, you know, you can figure out who's doing what for hepatitis C. You know, someone in Brazil is doing hepatitis C. It's got a microscope, and you can figure out right there they got what they've done so you can get ideas. That's a communication and then I want to hold webinars that way, too. That's we're going to set that up. So, well, if you had a microscope, you had questions, 
Let's view your microscope. Let's everyone else view it. And let's ask the questions and let's see if we can brainstorm it. You know, the problem is, like I said, my teachers have passed away. So we have to brainstorm a lot of things. And I want other minds into it because I don't have, you know, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. No, nobody does. Nobody does. Nobody does. But well, it's, it's the new beginning. Looking yeah. at the blood to me is, is you're looking at the actual life in action. Okay? And that to me is that's the future. Well, I'll get some important links from you to include in this information in the article and all that. And we'll see what we could do about helping you in any way we can, Harvey. Good, because because like you said, Lyme disease now is an epidemic, but it's not an epidemic by ticks. It's, you know, I've got now enough proof that it's an epidemic of doctors doing too much surgery. Yep. You know, to me, you got to look at surgery as an attack with a knife. You know, if you look at it, it's a legal attack with a knife. If you look at it that way, you're going to really question, wait a second, do I want, uh, I want my prostate taken care of? Do I, the woman say, do I want that hysterectomy? No, you really don't want that hysterectomy. You know, that's an attack with a knife. Yeah, and it's usually your body just trying to tell you something to get you to pay attention. That's what it is. That's what a symptom is. You know, if you have diarrhea, what medicine does today, if you have diarrhea, they stop it up. Well, that's crazy. The body is flushing it out. It stinks. It's awful. Why would you want to stop it up? Help the body <laughs> clean it up. You know, right. you know, I can tell you some stories about that, but it's a little too uh, colorful. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a long human history of killing the messenger, you know, so. Yes, yes. And we blame everything on the germ. And it's not the germ at all. It's the stagnant pond that the germ is living in. That's the story. It's not, you know, we are just germs that have organized into a physical body. You know, we're just germs. We have billions of germs in us. All of a sudden we say this one germ is nasty and the other couple billion are fine. Right. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> you know, look at the rationale behind it, too. You know, but it's the whole germ theory. Even Pasteur, who came up with it on his deathbed, recanted and said he was wrong. It's not the germ, but it's the terrain, the body it lives in that counts. Right. Well, I wish we could take this whole teaching to our macro world because it seems like we handle our relationships with other religions and nations and everything else the same exact way that we handle our medical symptoms. We, we attack it with an aggression. Yes. And, and, and it's, you know, everything is symbiotic. Nature is symbiotic. It works together in a, in a, in a plan. You don't see a fat deer. You know, it's only humans that are really abuse nature. Right. I think God gave humans free will because God's got a sense of humor, personally. Yeah, the, the only animals I've seen that are overweight and stressed out are the ones that hang around humans a lot. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dogs, cats, things like that. You know, deers, they, they will actually urinate on their food then come back an hour later and eat it. Okay, and it, Chinese do urine therapy. Urine... Your therapy is it's a waste product, but it's very honestly, uh, it's it's our own vaccination. Right. OK. You know, it's the concept of drinking it with the Chinese do, you know, is pretty offensive. But it, it, it doesn't make sense to tell you honestly. We, we have so much to learn, Harvey. We have so much to learn. Again, we're we're 100 percent failure. You know, so what makes us experts? We're just brainwashed on TV that experts say this and experts say that. And all you know, everyone's in a fancy white or a green outfit, you know, with masks on and they look special. And that's all just blown up propaganda. That's all it is. Yeah, sometimes I, I think learning is obviously the goal. But I think unlearning is the problem that we're up against. It's hard. It's difficult to unindoctrinate a person. When they've been indoctrinated in and they've bought into the system and they're so identified with it that their blinders and filters go up and it's hard to break that out way. Yeah, we've been brainwashed. And someone said to me, a dentist said to me one time, he says, you know, the average doctor lives four years less than the average person. You know why? Because <laughs> deep down they know they're full of garbage. Yeah. <laughs> they know. I, was, I was suicidal. And here I was, you know, I was a nice Jewish boy becoming a rich doctor. And I was in practice now for several years, and I was really suicidal because my patients never got better. No matter what I did, they right. were not happy. 
The only thing that worked was crisis medicine, but anything else, if I did surgery on it or something like that, I may have improved something, but you're never the same after someone cuts you with a knife. And people think, well, you're going to be better. No, your functioning is down. Your overall functioning, your uterus may not be bleeding, but your overall functioning is down. Right. Yeah, you know, it was very depressing being a regular doctor because, like I said, people never got better. And, and, and once I started to find a way to get people better, that now now my practice is I have so much fun. People come in limping, they walk out not limping. I've been playing with stem cells for oh about 10, 12 years now. My first case with stem cells was an autistic gal who recently graduated UC Davis with honors. Okay, we pulled her out of autism. She was born seven month intrauterine. She never fully developed. As soon as we gave her human stem cells, she just woke right up. She finished college and she's now engaged and doing great. Stem cells are the future. Oh yeah. I've done a lot of work with them. The French make stem cells from pigs that you can drink. We make it so fancy, you gotta do all this fancy surgery and drill it to your brain. No, the French make brain stem cells you can drink gets in through the mucous membranes of the mouth. They're so far ahead of us, but we're, we're controlled completely by the pharmaceutical industry. That's one of the reasons. Until we can, until the pharmaceutical uh, uh, system can do it and advertise it, we'll never see it. Yeah, it's funny. When you, when you look at our system, it seems like, because follow the money, you know, the old thing. It, yep. se it seems like the pharmaceutical companies, the, the medical association, that whole body of organizations and people can only make money they, they don't make money if you die and they don't make money if you're completely healed they only make money by sort of keeping you in the middle and not quite healing you but not quite killing you either they make money on disease i tell people you go into a doctor's office now and he's got drool coming out of his mouth and a knife behind his back <laughs> <laughs> can't wait to find something to do to make his living well, I can yeah. see why you ruffled some feathers, Harvey. <laughs> yes. You know, I seek the truth, okay? I took an oath. My oath was to, uh, to help people. My oath was not to serve the system. Okay? <laughs> yep. I, I follow my oath, and I follow, you know, the patient comes into me. They're paying me to help them. So, you know, that's what I do, and it's, it's a very rewarding practice when you can do that. Yep. My biggest problems are and and it's actually my most exciting is when a patient comes into me and i can't figure out what's going on now i spend all night long thinking about your case right. until they come up with an answer yeah you look like the kind of a person that's up for a challenge yeah it's, that's what it is you know i love i love a case that no one else I, I specialize in what i call mayo clinic failures okay right. i love cases that come to me that everyone else has failed on and it's up to me, the buck stops with me to figure out what the story is. And that's, if I can figure out, I get just about as much joy as the patient. I get so excited sometimes in the patient, I, I hug them and stuff. How many times do you go into a doctor's office and hug them? Never. Never. <laughs> I do that. Patients hug me. I love it. It's, it's, it's so much more fun to practice that way. Well, the next time we come in your area, I'm going to give you a call and maybe we can meet and give each other a hug. Okay, definitely, and definitely. And you, when you see your blood live, you'll be so amazed at it. You'll be, you'll be entranced. I'll have, a, I'll have a screen in front of you. I look in the microscope, you'll have a TV screen in front of you. You'll be entranced of what you see and the things that you see in your blood. Well, we'll definitely get together, Harvey. Good. I look forward to that. Yeah, thank you for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. It's, it was a real pleasure. So that's where I'm going to end it. Okay. And I, I'm really thinking... I don't know if you've seen our last issue, but it's it's about are we alone in the universe? Because we had so many people of our readers for about three or four years now asking us, hey, why don't you do an issue on what's going on with the government cover up and disclosure? There's like almost 500 people now, top military personnel, flight attendants, flight control tower people, <clears throat> government people, a couple of generals, and they're all saying the same thing. Hey, we need to be let out of our non-disclosure contracts because what's going on with the government and an advanced race of beings and UFOs needs to come out. And, and now I think <clears throat> France, Italy, Germany, Brazil, Belgium, 
uh, about three or four other countries have opened their UFO files, and it's pretty revealing, you know, some of the photographs and the dealings. So, but the, our next issue, we, we sort of want to focus back on uh, health. So we're really thinking about doing a, a really nice thing with what we're doing here with you and what you're doing. So I'll be in touch with you again on that. And I don't know if I'll, I, whether I'll transcribe this or have you write an article. I'm not too sure. Okay. Um, I'm a good writer. I love writing things. That, that keeps me busy. By the way, if there's a book, that if you go to my website, which is www.drbiggleson.com, Right. You go to my website, there's a book that you can pull down. The Med Medical Conspiracy? Yeah, the U.S. Yeah, Medical yeah. Conspiracy. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm already just about ready to do that. Matter of fact, I'm ready to click the download. That'll tell you the truth, and it's really scary. Yeah. It's really scary. You know, like I said, if they can pick my 28 cases out of my several thousand, okay, you know the spine on you, and if the spine on me there, you know the spine on you there also. Right. You oh, know, yeah. Yeah. Very scary. We do not have a free system. We have, I think it's a much more what I call a fascist control system. Well, right now, the, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the NSA, the National Security Agency, but right uh -huh. now, everything that we've said, all of our emails, all telephone conversations, everything that goes into the airwaves or across the wires goes through their system now. And when you see a picture of their, of their computer array, it, it like starts out and disappears off into the distance, row after row after row after row. And they're not only recording everything, all text messages from students and teenagers, everybody, but they're archiving it. Oh, so right. everything is being said, and they have these algorithms that can go in there and pick out words or phrases or even slight intentions that are people talking about something it doesn't seem like they're talking about what they're talking about it can even pick those out so we we need to really pay attention right now to what's going on it's very frightening in fact i i'm now going after through the freedom of information act my medicare records how did they find those 28 cases out of my several thousand files it's got to be there someplace unless they burn the records but i I'm sure they're not bright enough to burn the records as much as they're archived them. So yeah. I will know in a short period of time the exact story of why they came after me and how they came after me. Well, that'll be an interesting one to find. That'll be very interesting. I'm very excited about the potential of that. Yep. I'd be very disappointed if those records were destroyed. But I, well, you, know, you, you'd be surprised what they don't destroy. That's what my thinking is. Yeah, I, it's... I think they're too omnipotent. Yeah. You know, that they wouldn't think of destroying them because they're, they're just that omnipotent. All right. All right, Harvey, I'll let you get back to your day. And, okay, it's uh, a real pleasure. Again, right. thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. I enjoyed the heck out of it. And uh, the person that's working with you, Justin? Yes. Yeah, he, he's really cool, man. He 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 did a lot, and he's really uh, a personable person to have working with you. Justin, been, he's, we've been together for oh, probably about 30 years. Really, and he knows my work, and he's a good promoter of it because he really sees the truth. Yeah, he he was right on top of this. Yeah, All excellent. Right. Okay. Okay, you take care. You too. Okay. Bye bye. Have a good one. Bye.